Hello everybody, Mark here from Present Day Production with a cat on a Leslie, and this is a follow-up video on monitor placement to achieve the optimal listening experience when making, mixing, or mastering music. In the last video in the series, we discussed how to optimize your listening position and monitor placement in your room, paying particular attention to the low end or bass end of the frequency spectrum. And if you follow those guidelines, you should now have a listening position that is giving you the flattest bass response possible in your room with the shortest reverberation time. If you missed that video, then the link is at the top of the screen now, and we've also put this whole series in a playlist, so head back and watch that one first. In today's video, we'll look at what you can do to optimize the mids and highs and where you should be putting your speakers, so let's dive right in. We'll get into acoustic panels, the different types and the pros and cons of each in the next video, but in this one we'll discuss one of the simplest and most effective ways in which you can improve the detail, clarity and stereo imaging you're experiencing from your monitors. And you'll probably need to do this anyway to get you and your speakers in the optimal position if you followed the advice in our last video. If your speakers are mounted on your desk, be it the meter bridge of a mixing console or monitor plinths on a studio desk, you may now find that your optimal listening position is a little further away than you'd envisaged and you might not be able to reach the desk. And the way around this is to pull your desk out from the wall and put your speakers on proper stands behind it. And by proper stands, we don't mean something like this. If your speaker stands move when you nudge them, then they also move when they're playing audio, and we don't want that. It's no good using something like isolation mounts or pucks on wobbly stands, and I see that in a lot of home studios. So let's briefly talk about the three things we want a speaker stand to do. Firstly, we want it to hold the speakers firmly, and this means a hefty design. Lightweight metal stands generally aren't designed or built well enough to hold your speakers firmly enough, so consider a design like one of these. If you place your feet on the bottom of the stand and can easily twist or bend the tops, then they're no good. The second thing we want the speaker stand to do is to isolate your speakers from the floor. This stops the floor acting as a conduit for bass energy and can make a huge difference to the tightness of low end that you'll experience. And the third thing we want them to do is be inert in terms of resonance. Cheap metal stands ring, and we don't want that. If you're using the thicker leg type, then these are typically designed to be filled with dried sand or some other heavy loose material. This damps the stands and stops any ringing and also adds mass, helping to isolate more energy from the floor. But budget is often a hurdle, and if it is, then one of the most effective speaker stands you can make yourself is a column of bricks or concrete blocks. Concrete blocks are safer as they have a greater surface area and are less likely to fall over, and a few six inch concrete blocks placed at their flattest on their sides can make a great stand for near to midfield sized speakers. To aid isolation, we can use isolation pucks or supports between stand and speaker. And yes, you can cut tennis balls in half and use those, but they aren't nearly as effective as a properly designed and engineered isolation mount. These are really big in the hi-fi and audiophile world, and for good reason. They can really improve the resolution of the bass end, the clarity of the mids and highs, and stereo imaging that you're getting from your speakers. Putting your speakers on dedicated stands and pulling the desk out from the wall also has other advantages. It means it's easier to get behind the desk to patch things in when you need to, but it can also help with any mid-range reflections that having your speakers on the desk can introduce and emphasize. I remember when we moved our near fields off the meter bridge and onto stands when we had a large format analog console in the control room of our previous studio, and it made a huge difference. We could suddenly hear much more detail in the mid-range and treble than we could when they were bounced on the meter bridge. It was just helping to stop those reflections coming off the desk. As far as height is concerned, then you generally want your speakers with the tweeters at ear height. If you have a three-way design like we have, then usually the point between the mid-range driver and the tweeter will work best. If this isn't possible and you need to get your speakers higher, then you can angle them down so the tweeters are pointing at your ears, but this isn't ideal due to the shape of your ear and the fact that you'll usually be looking either straight ahead or slightly down at your screen or a bunch of controls on your desk. If you do have to have the speakers higher, then consider also having your screen higher so as your ears are at the correct angle in relation to the speakers and you're looking up a little, but this can lead to neck pain. And after having to have the speakers higher than ideal and pointed downwards in our main control room, in here, I've gone to whatever lengths I can to ensure that the tweeters are at ear height. This makes for a much more comfortable working day and my neck and back are thanking me for it. 
when Sam moved into one of our rooms here a few weeks ago, moving the desk out from the wall and putting the speakers on stands behind it for him was the first thing I suggested. This meant that Sam's Yamaha HS8s were a little too high with the tweeters firing just over his head as he likes to sit quite low at his desk. But rather than angle the speakers down, we simply flip them upside down. Now this again isn't ideal with a two-way design as the base driver is also taking care of most of the mid-range information and really you want your driver orientation from top to bottom, tweeter, mid-range, woofer until you get down to around four to 500 hertz. Below that base becomes far less directional which is why we can have base drivers next to each other in our ATCs rather than one above the other. But if I was to have these a little higher and flip these upside down, it would sound a bit odd. And I'm quite often trying to perceive height in a mix and having the tweeters under the mid driver would make that impossible. Sam suggested putting his monitors on their sides, NS10 style, but that's a big no-no with a two-way design that's built to be used vertically. Most speakers and the drivers in them are designed for good horizontal dispersion, therefore widening the sweet spot, and to put them on their sides means that you're compromising that characteristic and also skewing your stereo imaging and causing time alignment issues between the drivers. So pay attention to the manufacturer's intended orientation and try to stick to it if you can. The more drivers you have in your speakers, the more of an issue this can be. Exceptions would be something like a Tannoy dual concentric design. We had a pair of these in their vertical orientation in our previous main control room, and when we moved here, we decided to install them horizontally. Now, the Tannoys have a dual concentric driver, so the tweeter is actually installed in the center of the woofer, and so the speakers are a single point source. This means that you can have the cabinets in any forward facing orientation you like, even diagonally if you want to, and it won't affect the stereo imaging at all. Well, you may hear a difference if edge diffraction is coming into play, but we had ours flush mounted in the wall, so the change from vertical to horizontal wasn't an issue at all. So by now, you and your speakers should be in about the best place in the room for you to make accurate mix decisions, certainly with regard to the low end, and they should ideally be on firm and effective stands or supports at the optimal position for low end from the wall. And once again, if you need a reminder on how to get your base energy in the room under control, then head back to our previous video in the series and check that one out. That's all for this one. We'll be looking at acoustic treatment, the different kinds of acoustic panels and explaining the difference between sound velocity and sound pressure in the next episode and why you need different kinds of trap to deal with different kinds of energy and then we'll round the series off by answering your questions as well as looking at photos some of you have sent in and discussing ways that you can improve your monitoring environment so if there's anything you'd like to know please leave a question in the comments below remember create don't hate hit the thumbs up if you like this video hit the thumbs down twice if you didn't and you'll see us in the next one